Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who has joined us for this exciting session today. My name is Meena Krishnan and I am the Global Corporate Marketing Director at Tipco Software. Today, I'm truly honored to be part of this panel discussion titled Driving Forward with Data. The objective and purpose of the session is to discuss the significance and relevance of data and data analytics in STEM and non-STEM careers and applications, diversity in tech and engineering with a focus on women in STEM, data analytics and its importance in today's world, and how students and academics can prepare to enter the world of engineering and data analytics. It is my true honor to introduce to you three inspiring and phenomenal leaders that join me today on the panel. First, I would like to introduce to you Yana Marley Ziskova. She is the co-founder and CEO of Mero, and she loves data. Yana is an avid data and diversity advocate and has headed teams and country operations at Estee Lauder, Sybase, SAS, and Social Bakers. In 2015, she left the corporate career to start a data consultancy, soon followed by a Singapore-based customer data platform tech startup, Mero, where she is the CEO. At the same time, Yana co-founded the nonprofit global movement called She Loves Data. Since 2016, and this number is mind-boggling, 14,000 women have attended 170-plus free data and tech workshops certification programs and webinars through She Loves Data, which has chapters in 17 countries on five continents. She Loves Data received the 2019 Diversity Initiative Award in Asia by Women in IT. In 2009 and 10, Yana was named one of the top 25 businesswomen in the Czech Republic, and she is featured on the inaugural 2020 Singapore 100 Women in Tech list. What an honor it is to have you today on the panel to discuss something you're so passionate about, data. Welcome, Yana. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Lizzie Thompson, who is a performance and simulation engineer in the Vehicle Dynamics Group at Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team. In Lizzie's role, she is responsible for pre-event simulation work analyzing the different setup options on the car to help the team be as prepared as possible for a given race weekend. And she has six years of experience in Formula One after starting her career in 2016 as the inaugural winner of the Autosport Williams Engineer of the Future Award. During her career, Lizzie has worked in various departments, including mechanical design and aerodynamics prior to her current role in the vehicle dynamics group. In her own words, she says, something all of my roles have had in common is a requirement to analyze data to make quick decisions in a fast paced environment, whether that means working through a problem in a few days or providing answers in a few hours between practice sessions on a Friday. How exciting is that? I really enjoy the challenge as it requires me to constantly develop my data analytics skills to reflect the continuous rate of development in Formula One who better to talk to today about data and data analytics. Welcome, Lizzie. Thank you, yeah, excited to be here. <laughs> Finally, I would like to introduce Helene Snelting. She is the Director of Data Science and she works with Mia here at TIPCO. Helene brings over 20 years of analytics and team leadership to TIPCO with an international career spanning manufacturing QA, CPG and retail and software and technology. Helene is a thought leader in visual analytics and data science industry solutions. She and her team here at TIPCO help customers optimize their business using data science. Helene is passionate about knowledge sharing and the TIPCO community. She has an MBA from Portland State University, and get this, an MSc in food science from Wahaningen University. We've got to talk about that transition, Helene, for sure. We're going to touch on that. Helene currently lives in south of London with her husband and two teenage daughters. Welcome, Helene. So excited to have you. Thank you, Nina. Great to well, be I here. Must, yeah, you betcha. So I must say I've been truly invigorated as we got to know each other when we were prepping for this panel session, and I really cannot wait for us to jump right in. So the first question, I want to address it to all three of you. I would like to ask you what you would like your audience to get out of this discussion today. So let's maybe start with you, Lizzie. 
Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think for me, I would like to increase the visibility of women working with data and in, in technical roles. I think when you work in a male dominated environment, you have to be a bit creative with who your role models are and look a bit further afield. And that's exactly what events like this do. They increase visibility and provide role models for people who don't immediately see them. So, yeah. You bet. You bet. Yana, how about you? For me, it is um, understanding that no matter who you are, what you've done in your career, you can always start with data. It's never too late. And as well, I can actually second Lizzie. Um, it's amazing to have uh, female leaders, uh, you know, your caliber ladies here to see and actually showcase that um, it's completely normal to be in a completely male dominated industry like F1 and uh, having, you know, a typical roles that in a past we imagine that it's usually a male's um, kind of role. So let's talk about that and let's uh, discuss how, how it feels and how it's possible for other people to enter those fields. Awesome, awesome. Helene, how about you? Yeah, I think just to compliment that, I, I mean, I hope this is going to be a very interactive session with everyone in the audience. And uh, I really hope everyone leaves with a very positive feeling about the opportunity that working with data brings. You bet, you bet. All of those are fabulous things to take away after this session. Um, Helene, I want to kind of transition to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the data science life cycle? Um, and, and, you know, like you said, we would love the audience to put in their comments, their questions, as well as you go through this whole thing to clarify some of the, I would say, misconceptions about data analytics, data engineering, the whole life cycle. Yeah, I think I think part of it is just learning what you know th about the terminology uh, in data, and um, I will uh, you know take a look at this from a data science perspective. Um, you know, th the good thing is um, when you think about roles in data, the, the the market is booming, so there are lots of opportunities for everyone. But the roles can be quite different. So uh, hopefully, in this uh, panel, we we give a little bit of an explanation of what all these different aspects are, um, and um, you know the reason why it's booming is because organizations are increasingly getting a lot of value from data. And, you know, Lizzie will, will share examples later, um, but we see um, at TIPCO a lot of companies who are optimizing, you know, processes in man manufacturing or farming. You know, when you produce products or when you grow crops, you can use IoT data to understand your processes and optimize and, uh, and therefore, you know, reduce the number of resources that are needed, such as energy and water, which is huge today and, and for our future. Um, and, and, you know, the decisions that we make as consumers, uh, you know, buying products or using healthcare, um, you know, you leave a, a data footprint that can then be used to improve the services that you consume and, uh, and the way that you get treated by these uh, retailers and, and service providers. Um, but that doesn't happen just with the press of a button. There's quite a bit of work involved in building these AI applications that make that happen. Um, and um, within our team, we talk about the data science lifecycle, um, uh, and it's it, it basically sort of talks about all the different steps involved in building a data science application. It starts with a really good understanding of the, the business uh, needs, uh, then a really good understanding of the data. Um, then you often have to do some data engineering because the data needs to be put in a format that actually works with the models that you have in mind. Then you build the models, you evaluate the models, and if you find your your best model, uh, you want to put it in uh, production or deploy it. And once it's deployed, you actually also need to monitor it. So there's a model ops aspect to that as well. And that's a continuous process because your model will need to be updated now and then. Um, and um, the roles that you will see in job descriptions are business analyst, uh, data engineer, data scientists who are more focused on, on the statistical aspects of, of data science. Um, and then, you know, to deploy and put a model in production, you've got um, machine learning engineers, DevOps engineers, and often AI architects who help optimize this whole, whole process. So a lot of different names uh, to roles and a lot of different skills needed. So I think, Lizzie, it would be uh, really interesting to hear from your day-to-day uh, -day work with Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team, how you use data in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So um, to dig into a little more what that means, working with data on a day to day basis, I'll talk about maybe a different type of life cycle, but the life cycle of data that we have here. Mm -hmm. And that would start with anything that you can measure. That's what data is. So whether that be from the sensors that we run on the race car on a race weekend, whether it be from the wind tunnel, the simulation data. Um, 
we would then take that, that um, um, process it into something that we can understand that's human readable. Um, that would be the job of a data processing engineer, for example. Then we have something that we can work with and analyze. So this is where your data analysts would come in, looking at trends and trying to understand what the data is telling us using maybe typical Spotfire. And this is the kind of stage of the process in which I work and I'm familiar. Mm -hmm. um, Elaine, you mentioned data science. So maybe you'd be fitting models um, to that um, in order to better understand what the data can tell you. And then the end game of that is to make decisions, right? So for us, that's all about adding performance to the race car, making it go quicker. And so having all those trends and understanding of the data that we have means that somebody, for example, a race engineer at the track, when the driver comes in from a run and says, I have this problem in this corner, we know exactly what tools we have to fix that because we have the data, we have the trends, and we're able to quickly make the changes that we need to target the problems that we're finding. Wow. So basically, I, I love that you touched on, you know, measure, model, you analyze and then you draw the conclusions from that. I think that's that's such a great kind of flow of the data. Um, so, you know, just switching gears a little bit, I wanted to go to you, Yana. Um, if you can describe to us how She Loves Data helps students and women succeed in a data analytics career, just elaborate a little bit more on that because there's so much of exciting um, opportunities that you give anyone who wants to get into this, this really up and coming and and fast growing field? Well, as Helene said, you know, there is a, such a shortage or everyone needs to understand a little bit about data because in every profession, and now we are not talking only about technology and being in tech and data, you know, you need to understand that this is basically foundational knowledge. And uh, so, so with She Loves Data, look, I've been working with data for my, uh, you know, many decades, you know, too, too many. And uh, what, I, what I've seen and what I've talked to my clients and organizations we worked with, they, they were basically saying, hey, you know, we need data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, you know, and it's a, it's a huge shortage on the market. And uh, with women being the largest minority group in tech, you know, let's, let's be honest. Now, let, let's talk about uh, a gender diversity here that we so badly need. You know, is the obvious group really to look at and to bring them in closer to technologies. So this is what we did simply five years ago. We brought in uh, women and we said, hey, you can ask anything you want about data. We created a safe space to ask any questions. And we started to explain how data is an asset for any organization and how in any profession you will need to understand that. And hoping that we will, in this process, explaining, you know, what data and tech is in this, you know, fast moving world, technology world and digital world, um, is that we convert some people and they will have um, interest in entering into the roles of uh, aspiring data analysts and data engineers. And this is five years ago or more than five years ago. Today, as you said, we have a community of about 18,000 people around the world. And what is fantastic, I think, is that we do not only focus on the competence gap that we you know, try to address, but we as well focus on the confidence gap. This morning, I read that 75% of female executives are suffering with an imposter syndrome. So wow. confidence is as well important, right? When you change journey or you, you change industry and job. So that uh, leads us to the third gap that we address and it's a leadership gap because we need more women in any kind of organization. And usually the digital and tech skills are the blockers for them to progress in their careers. So that's what we focus on. Wow, that's awesome. And I think we need more and more of that. Um, so you're saying you, you provide the hard skills, but you also provide those soft skills that are needed to get into this field and succeed. Exactly. And, and the soft skills are now becoming essential skills because you need to have those skills like, you know, curiosity and, um, you know, ability to learn about being agile and flexible. So this is becoming very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I started my career again a few decades ago, um, it was all self-taught, right? You know, um, yeah. initially the confidence was not there. You get in, you have the imposter syndrome. Why am I 
being so successful, I haven't really done that much, you know, um, and then you have to tell yourself, you know, no, I'm going to go there, I'm going to be confident. So providing these tools now, I think is going to really jumpstart many uh, women who want to get into this field and, and succeed. So, so fabulous work there. Uh, before we kind of move on to the next question, which I had for Lizzie, I wanted to address one of the questions that came through the chat. Um, this is from Bharat. And he says, hi guys, I'm from the VLSI background, but how does data analysis help me if I opt this path? So in a VLSI path, for example, how would data help him? Is there is there an answer for that from any of you? And you can feel free to jump in, any of you. I don't know what a VLSI path is. Maybe um, Baras can add that to the Yeah. <laughs> Do you Something know? to do with semiconductors, if I'm not mistaken, Bharat. Please go ahead ah. and check that in in your um, in your so, chat, and then we can pick it up from there. But let's let's assume it's yeah. something in in semiconductors. Yeah. So I mean, I can answer to that. We actually at Tipco we do a lot with the semiconductor industry. So I think as Lizzie was mentioning, you know, equipment and and uh, cars in in her example. Um, but equipment in a manufacturing facility produces a lot of data or data. <laughs> and so being able to analyze that data and optimize the manufacturing process, whether it's about, you know, detecting faults early in the production process to, to reduce, you know, rework and reduce waste um, or improve certain steps in the production process, looking at quality. I mean, there's lots that you can do. And um, I think the, the semiconductor industry is 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 quite far ahead in terms of producing data to uh, allow this to happen. So it's very interesting space to watch. Wow. And we do have some, do we have that case study maybe on the TIPCO uh, um, on our on our website somewhere? We do. Oh. We can add this to the, um, we have several semiconductor examples actually on our TIPCO website with customers that we could add to the chat as well. Yeah. That's awesome. So Parat, hopefully you can visit TIPCO, uh, the TIPCO.com website and uh, go and look at some of our use cases and find uh, that we have a couple there that would uh, give you an idea of how we work with the semiconductor industry. Um, yeah. So Can I um, add one comment, Mina, yeah, on that absolutely. one? Um, because I think we're also posting a, a link to the analytics forum where a number of our semiconductor customers will be uh, likely speaking. Uh, they always speak every year in that conference. So um, uh, that's a free conference to join as well. So uh, um, that will be a good way to find out uh, about these real life stories as well. <laughs> that's awesome. And I think that event is going to take place between June 13th and 15th. So feel free to join that event to learn more about many of the use cases uh, uh, for our um, analytics um, technology. Um, Lizzie, I'm going to move to you next. Um, can you describe your career in engineering since your graduation? How things have improved from a diversity perspective since you joined uh, the team, for example, or you know, what are the changes you've seen and how your career has kind of progressed since your graduation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you touched on how I started my career in your very flattering introduction, but um, I started on a graduate scheme, which was an award scheme. So it was a competition with several rounds and the final one was a round of five finalists, um, all four of which, apart from me, were male. Um, so I immediately knew what I was in for in the industry. <laughs> um, but I think actually in that case, I was so... Um, kind of what's the word I didn't I didn't believe I had a hope <laughs> and actually the in that case it really played to my advantage because I think I felt so much more relaxed um, and it helped my performance I think I performed better on the day because I just had no pressure on myself so there was definitely a lesson to be learned from that in itself but um, yeah I then started on a graduate scheme I did two years moving around the different engineering departments um, in a Formula One team before deciding that I enjoyed working with data um, and I worked in aerodynamic performance for several years before starting my current role in vehicle dynamics. Um, so yeah, a range of different roles. And I think we are seeing change. Um, we're seeing a lot more women join at the graduate graduate levels in technical roles. Um, we're also seeing, you know, more and more companies pushing for diversity and realizing how important it is to have a diverse workforce and the performance that that can bring as well. Um, Mercedes, AMG, um, Petronas, for example, the team has a um, initiative called Accelerate 25 um, in which they are committing to 
um, 25% of their new hires from being from underrepresented backgrounds. And actually in the latest figures, they're beating those targets. So we are seeing more and more women in underrepresented groups enter, <laughs> enter the workforce. Um, but I think the next challenge will be propagating those changes up to the leadership levels, as Yanni, you were saying, um, seeing more women in management and you know, identifying what the barriers are still standing to that and trying to bring those down and propagate those changes upwards. That's awesome. Um, you know, here at TIPCO, we also have an OKR to kind of um, increase the, the women that we are hiring in our company. And we have also beaten the target of 40% uh, women hiring uh, at TIPCO. So I think we're all moving in the right direction and we have to keep going in that direction. So <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Um, just keeping in that uh, kind of, uh, you know, thread, uh, Yana, I wanted to come to you next uh, to reflect a little bit on Women's History Month that just happened in March. Um, lots of events, lots of exciting panels and talks. I know here at TIPCO, um, Helene, you and I attended some really exciting talks as well and panels and discussions. I just wanted you to reflect on it, um, you know, look a little bit on, into breaking the bias, allyship. <clears throat> Can you comment on it? And just let us know what your thoughts are on that and what you your experience during Women's History Month was. So look, um, I usually I'm usually starting any kind of discussion in the months of March that we cannot focus only on those topics throughout March. We have to do it the whole year around. And I think this is important. But uh, what I've heard this year and what was really interesting were the discussion that we need to stop fixing women and we should be fixing the structures and the procedures and we should be basically fixing the environment that is stopping women. And I really like that because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, um, focus on allies and mentors, focus on changing procedures in the organization so that there is a pipeline of women. So we cannot only hire them and change hiring processes, but we need to as well ensure that we have a processes throughout the organization to feed up to the leadership positions. And it's very, very important. What as well was uh, great, where discussion about that we women, we don't need to be a superheroes. We don't need to have several different multi multitasking positions, you know, at home, at work, that it's okay to kind of stop and say, hey, enough is enough, I need to take a break. And I think that's great that, you know, a lot of discussions on these topics that we try to be so perfect and we don't need to in any occasions. But I think those structural changes that um, we often, uh, heard about, it's actually coming into core of all of us, us as individuals. We need to start with us and we need to kind of identify what are our biases and what are, I give you an example. Uh, years ago, I had a team of data scientists, 30 men, we hired one woman, a client calls me and says, I want to have this girl on my team and I pay double the, you know, mandate rate for her. And I reacted are you kidding me like this is so bad what you just do like it's like it's because i had all the different reasons you know for him to asking me for getting her on his team then the right one and the, and he was like what do you mean like she's bringing in so many different hypotheses she's bringing in so many different questions and solutioning with her is so different than with the 10 other guys that are sitting on the table so it's coming back what lizzie said you know, we need diversity because it brings better results. And I think this is now seen in our organizations and we see hopefully some changes, you know, coming through. Wow. Wow, that's fabulous. Do you have any comments on allyship at all? You know, I think that's a very important factor as well, right? As we move forward in this direction. Look, I think, um, and um, I think we can't do it on our own. We talk about women uh, and it cannot be just women. So we will not solve it in our half of the population. We need to have, and it starts always with the lines. It starts with people that are stepping up and then they are basically uh, initiating the changes. It's starting with uh, progressive um, leaders, male leaders, female leaders, allyship doesn't need to be, you know, opposite gender because often in the discussions, what I've heard was that the ally for women is this, 
you know, a hero. It's the guy, it's the manager who got it and stepped out, you know, uh, out of the comfort zone. Um, and I think it's not like that. It should be anyone can be a lie. And um, those are the people who are basically helping with the structure, structural changes. And we need them and we need to lift them up. We need to follow them. And um, yeah, hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, I, I think we are seeing a lot of changes already. That's awesome. What a powerful message that is, you know, on allyship, because you're right. We all kind of think of an ally as someone who is not, who is of the opposite, who, you know, is of the opposite gender or identifies as the opposite gender, but we never think of it as anyone. It can be anyone. I can be an ally for someone as well. So, um, you know, that, that's a very powerful message. I know, Helene, you had some um, great resources on allyship as well. Um, you know, uh, that you, you wanted to touch on with, uh, with some of the panels we had here at TIPCO. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I couldn't share my screen and uh, <laughs> unmute myself at the same time. So yeah. let me also um, share a screen because we had a really great session at um, uh, actually at the Women's History Month last month. And um, it was um, with a, a special speaker or guest speaker, Gabriela Schuster. Um, and she is um, uh, she, she is a, um, you know, a veteran. She's a um, C-level um, executive at Microsoft. And she has, you know, 30 years of um, leadership experience. And she is a, a great advocate for women. And she created this um, this framework that is um, hashtag allies, A-L-L-I-E-S, uh, easy, easy to remember. Um, and she basically taught us at TIPCO a lot of um, uh, types of behavior that you can learn and exhibit or demonstrate um, as an ally. And we've spent a whole hour talking about this. So it, it very much is in line with what Jana was just saying. Um, and I think it's, you know, it can be men and women um, and it, it doesn't matter what um, you know, minority you're talking about. This applies to gender diversity, um, you know, ethnic diversity, neurodiversity. I think finding out, you know, who you need to support and being an ally for them uh, is, is very useful. Um, and basically you're giving space to the people that need more space in your organization and recognizing when that is needed. And I think that awareness is, is really, really important. So allies stands for advocate, listen, lift, include, elevate and sponsor. And these are all methods that you can, you know, step by step, learn to exhibit and, and be a better ally um, and, and create a better organization. Because I think, uh, you know, time and time again, it's proven that diverse organizations are uh, more profitable, more successful. People are happier. And it's become, you know, a skill that I think everyone should really be able uh, to sort of aspire to, to be able to to manage, retain um, a diverse team is, is something, you know, really um, important in today's uh, skills in the job. Awesome. Awesome. That's an excellent uh, background to have. And we, we will uh, put this link up as well for people to kind of go in and look at Gabriella's um, fantastic website. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about something fun with Lizzie. Uh, but before that, we have one question that came up uh, from Daniel Seidel that I wanted to address. He asks, do you feel that data and analytics is taught enough at schools and universities? I ask, as during my university degree in geology, data was talked about, but in reality, I had a lot to learn once I graduated. So I think um, this is something that, you know, all of us can reflect on, you know, I, I, as the person who kind of leads the academic alliance here at TIPCO, one of the things I go out and talk about with any of the universities is how data is so prolific that, you know, using the tools that we can provide to, to get that concept into any of the coursework that they do is really key. Uh, and this is not just in stem type of subjects right it is also beyond that in in you know business administration and other non-stem um you know kind of disciplines as well just like the geology discipline that that was brought up by daniel so i just wanted to hear from all of you i think there's a lot more to be done in universities and schools and colleges with data um and and certainly that is something that we are working towards at pipco with the academic alliance program but I, you know, we, we give out free licenses of our of our data analytics tools, um, and it's the latest technology that we we actually uh, give out for free for all of the students and academics that want to use it in 
classrooms and in research uh, labs, uh, nonprofit research labs. So we're promoting it that way. And I wanted to see what everyone else has to say about that. I think, um, and, and as, as we are part of, She Loves Data is part of this TIPCOS initiative. So we are as well um, talking about data, we're using Spotfire. So it's it's exciting because it gives people possibility as well to own the tool for, you know, and, and use it, maybe bring it to work and use it for additional other activities. But I think, look, I think universities um, have a hard job nowadays because the technology is advancing so fast and it's hard to keep up with the curriculum. So, um, and, and as well, once we go through the university degree and then we are out there in the, you know, professional life, um, I think never stop learning is something that we need to adopt and uh, we need to go and learn as we are, you know, going through our career uh, because simply the university degree will not be enough and whatever they taught us at the university because every three, four years you have a huge new trend which basically shifts and changes the entire um, tech space. So um, I wouldn't, I agree that universities can do better, but I think that it's as well up to us as we go through the careers, you know, it's gonna be completely different than 20 years ago when degree was enough and then for 20 years you could do your job and it was okay. Exactly, yeah. And I think, you know, the opportunities that, that She Loves Data provides is fabulous. Um, we have some great Spotfire courses as well that you offer. Um, so I would encourage everyone to go and check out the She Loves Data um, website as well as the TIPCO Academic Alliance website. Uh, I'm really excited, Yana, at, at the partnership that we're forging and, and, and the plans we have uh, to really encourage this sort of thing, right? When people want to learn more, get into data analytics and, and, and really shine in that field. So I can't wait for us to partner more on that. Um, okay, so Lizzie, we wanna shift a little bit to you. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, being on the team, I'm sure you have a lot of really fun anecdotes working in a garage. So I, I just wanted to see if you can share something with us to lighten up this conversation a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I should say that uh, not, not everybody who works in Formula One gets to go to the racetrack and see everything. You know, there are so many important, important people working at the factory and behind the scenes. So if you meet someone who's working in motorsport, don't immediately assume that they, <laughs> they work in a garage. But as Mina knows, I have had the opportunity to do that in, in my career. Um, and I think so often if people are thinking about data, you'd be thinking about numbers and spreadsheets and graphs. Then, doesn't always come in those forms. Um, something that uh, a lot of Formula One teams do is um, something called flow visualization paint. Um, so we get a lot of data from wind tunnel and simulations um, that would help you visualize the aerodynamic flow over, over a race car. And you can actually measure that on track as well um, by applying paint to the car. Um, I'm sure any Formula One fans watching will have seen this during test sessions and practice sessions, um, cars covered in colorful paint. And if you've ever wondered what it's about, um, it is wet when it leaves the garage, but it dries on track and it shows you the streamlines of the flow over the car. Um, I've had the job of actually applying this paint in the, in the past. And <laughs> let me tell you, it is one of the most intimidating and exhilarating experiences because everybody's working on the car there's a huge team of mechanics and everybody is so professional and efficient in what they do and they're working to an you know uh to the minute clock of when the car is due to leave the garage and you need this paint to be wet when it leaves and dry on the track not dry in the garage not dry before <laughs> um so you basically have to fight your way to the front in front of all these mechanics at the right time um, spray the car, make sure you cover it really well um, so that you get the data that you need. Um, and doing this <laughs> is absolutely terrifying. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, this is so scary. I've never seen another woman doing this. Um, there are more and more women in the garages these days and uh, on the TV coverage, but I hadn't seen it at the time. And it just adds an extra level of, you know, we've talked about confidence, but um, don't like of it feeling more daunting for you. Um, but I did it and we got some great data. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, 
actually staying in that role for several years, I had the chance to see a lot of more um, junior engineers coming up and having this task, which is, it's almost like a trial by fire, this task. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know what, I realized this is this is terrifying for everybody stepping to the front and in front of this engine on Formula One car ready to go. Um, and whilst there may be an extra layer for it, if you are in a minority or feel like you are, um, actually, everybody has similar feelings of lacking confidence and, um, you know, wondering if you can take on a task um, and you've just got to give it your, your best go. Um, and, you know, if you can go home at the end of the day and say, I did the best job that I could have done for me myself today, then then that's the only thing that can really make you happy. So. Wow, what a story. And I think we all have felt that way at some time, right? I mean, I can just imagine, I look at the pit stops. I'm a big Formula One fan. So <laughs> I watch the races, every, you know, every weekend from practice session on to race day. And I can see, you know, pit stops and everyone getting there and you're done with, you know, 2.4 seconds. You're done with changing the tires. I tried my hand at it when I was in Boston <laughs> at one. I, I was there for like a minute and still couldn't yeah. <laughs> One lug nut off. So, you know, I know how intimidating it is when everyone's so professional doing yeah. everything at such speed and you have to jump up in front and do what you have to at just the right moment for the paint, yeah. just the right, you know, wetness, dryness, whatever to get out there. So, wow, kudos. And I think that's a big lesson for everyone to take away and be confident, step up and be confident. Tell yourself if you do your best. That's all that matters. I am all of five foot, two and a half, three inches. And I remember many times at the beginning of my career having to stand in front of three, four hundred people to talk when I, you know, I'm surrounded by these confident people who are way bigger than me, both in stature as well as knowledge. And you have to go up in front and talk and and shine. So I can understand that feeling. That's that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that anecdote with us. Um, so, Helene, I wanted to touch on that one thing that I was talking about when I introduced you. You had such a big transition in, in career. You know, you, you went from food science to MBA to data. Um, you know, I just I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. You know, I was reading the Harvard Business Review and I, you know, the you know, one of the things they said was the first tactic is to make any boundaries be between business and data scientists highly porous because that's a big connection. Right. If you can connect data to business. Mm -hmm. That's very yeah. powerful. So, you know, with you, you have that whole kind of transition, food science, and then you went to business and then data. So I think we have something very powerful here, you know, taking your knowledge and using it. So um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you pivoted and transitioned into this role? Yeah, sure. So I think in my career, I've had, you know, different motivations to, to, to move to next roles and uh, sort of having an international career was part of that as well. Uh, so there's sometimes a reason to look for jobs in, in certain regions and, and, and expand my uh, uh, sort of my boundaries that way. Um, but I was always interested in, in STEM. Um, data didn't really come into play. Uh, I mean, it, I took a lot of statistics courses when I was in university, but um, I really uh, learned to, to appreciate it again when I uh, started working at IRI, the market research company. Um, and um, I think I was... In my interview process with TIPCO, I think the value that my manager, um, our chief analytics officer, Michael Connell, saw and, and I think still sees in, in people like me is the industry experience, because I worked in the, the CPG and retail industry for many years with data. And I, I could see, you know, on a daily basis, the value of the tools that bring all the data together and provide the insights that, you know, then generate that competitive advantage. And being able to translate the business requirements to technical requirements, even though I'm actually not coding myself, um, is really valuable. And I think this is also what I tried to explain at the beginning. There's all these different roles that are important in making uh, AI applications successful. We haven't even talked about ethics um, and explainability yet. Also really important uh, today uh, in, in AI and data science. So um, I think everyone sort of finds their their way to data. It's also not for everyone. <laughs> I think that's also true, but you have to try it out. And um, uh, yeah, I, I think Jana actually uh, started saying, you know, there's no wrong time to start working in data. And for me, it, it came with my second job um, because I, I missed it. I missed a sort of uh, intellectual <laughs> uh, challenge. But um, yeah, you can come to data in different ways, I think. 
Wow. So it's never too late. I just wanted to get that message out to everyone today who is in the audience here. If you feel that data excites you, the insights you get from data excites you, it's always, you know, uh, there's always a chance to pivot. Um, so um, with that, I wanted to, to go to you, Yana. Um, some people are actually confused with the direction that they have to take with their careers in, you know, and they, they're, you know, at this point where they're wondering, right. Um, there's so much talk about big data, data analytics, data science, data engineering, um, and, and also big talk about the career opportunities that are out there, you know, with, with data. Um, so, uh, you know, is, is pivoting and changing your career, something that's good. You've already touched on it a little bit. Uh, but can you give us a little bit more advice uh, as to how that can be done? Um, you know, uh, anything for anyone who's listening out there who wants to do this now? So about, I think, 38 or 40 percent of people that come to She Loves Data are in some kind of changing transition period in their careers. And they're looking basically for some upskilling uh, platform so they can either you know, future-proof their own career or switch industries, switch professions. And they, um, as they are in the middle of their career, usually it's a harder time to find some um, network and some programs that would be relevant. And I think this is the core for She Loves Data that we um, saw that with those women specifically that are, you know, trying to find what to do next. Uh, it's hard to fill in the gaps that they might have because they, you know, went to the maternity leave or took uh, care of their uh, elderly parents. You know, it can be various different um, reasons. And uh, what we saw is that there is a need for this foundational knowledge in data and tech, no matter actually what you do, because the future of work is uh, driving everyone uh, into a position where you need to understand some basic understanding of you know what is data and how you can benefit in your role and, and help the organization be better. So um, what I've seen is that organizations are now more um, looking for something that I believe it was Deloitte who called it purple profile. It means exactly what Helene just described. It is someone who has either tech or business background and then, you know, combines um, additional skill set. So the, the human capabilities and, uh, you know, a business uh, understanding together with understanding of a technology or the digital space. And when you combine it, those are the roles that are now basically being created for organizations. And it's hard to find those individuals. So what I feel that pivoting now is actually bringing a huge opportunities because as we are moving through the fourth uh, technical revolution so fast, you don't need to have any more 10 years of experience in one particular field or one particular particular domain uh, subject. It is okay to, you know, be self-taught. And I think even organizations are looking for people that are learning fast, the new skills, that they are able to demonstrate those, um, you know, agile approaches to uh, completing the profile mm -hmm. for those new jobs. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, it's as well great that they are specifically for women a networks like She Loves Data, where you find the like-minded individuals, you can create study groups, and you can kind of, you know, share experiences. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I know it's um, it's tough because I was reading in an article that a good data analyst um, not only needs to have the hard skills that you mentioned, but also the soft skills that you mentioned, right? Be a good, you know, be good at communication, be an empathetic listener, because unless and until you listen carefully as to what exactly, what trends people are looking for, you don't know what type of data you have to pick up and analyze, you know, be context focused because you need the context as to what you're going to do with that data. You know, note taking progress, creative, abstract thinking, engineering mindset, attention to detail, so many things. So I think it's an exciting, exciting field to be in because you can bring those soft skills that you have, just like Helene said, you know, with all her transition and what she did, bring all of that and really become a successful um, you know, uh, professional in this, in this arena. So, so that's fabulous. Um, I want to shift again to Lizzie. I want to, to see if you can give us a few examples of some key successes, successes you've had 
up to this point in your career. Um, you've just, you know, it's phenomenal to be talking to someone in, in this sort of field, right, on the team. So, so if you can just give us a couple of those, especially for the young professionals out there maybe who want to get into this, uh, this field. Yeah, absolutely. I think one one thing I've I've definitely learned um, is that in Formula One, no no success is individual whatsoever. Um, all successes are are down to the team itself. Um, uh, it, it may sound corny, but it is it is true. You don't win races and championships unless you're working as a team. So, um, I speaking of changes in careers as well, I changed role to my current role. It's it was quite um, a big change for me, doing something very new to me. Um, and the first um, event which I worked for, um, for for the team was Brazil last year. Um, it was the first time I made a real contribution to the team in my new role. And um, Lewis Hamilton won that race in one of the most epic drives in Formula One history. And it was just amazing that feeling to have contributed my bit to that weekend and to have seen it. <laughs> it was... For anyone who hasn't watched that weekend, go back and watch it. It was an outstanding, um, outstanding race the whole weekend, in fact. And just to have been part of that and to feel that success and and feel the success of the people around you as well um, was a real proud moment for me. Um, definitely felt like a big achievement um, in my career. So um, despite the fact that, you know, I was only a small part of it, but that still still felt absolutely amazing. So. Well, you're just being humble. That's that's fabulous <laughs> achievement. <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to just quickly share one thing because Lizzie has mentioned two things that you know that that you know she's really proud of and um, maybe first scared of and went out of her comfort zone. And I think we talked about the self confidence. And I think what we've learned in the uh, you know in this in in our skills of dealing with that over time that those are the moments that you need to remember when you're nervous. So, you know, have those in mind when you do something that is, you know, scary for the first time. And remember that the times that you actually did that went out of your comfort zone and was successful. It will give you the right energy. And and um, and this is, you know, this is proven <laughs> in your, your biochemistry as well, that that really sets you up for your next success as well. Isn't that awesome? Absolutely. Absolutely, Helene. Um, you know, uh, moving on, I just wanted to also, uh, Helene, talk to you a little bit about how important diversity is in tech and engineering and the data industry and what positive actions can you take, um, you know, towards this? Okay, yeah, I think, I mean, we've talked about, um, actually, Anna mentioned quite a few of those. So allyship, really important, um, uh, um, you know, ERGs, employee resource groups, well supported, both for the minorities as well as the allies. Um, I think for diversity, uh, recruitment is, is really important. So making some changes in, in ensuring that you have a diverse um, uh, candidate pool, but also a diverse uh, selection committee or, or you know, interview uh, team um, and continuous training for all employees everywhere. Um, you mentioned that at TIPCO, we've, we've, um, you know, we were now at 40% female hired. Yes. Um, this, is, this has increased uh, the percentage of women at TIPCO from 20%. Uh, seven percent to thirty-two, uh, but not only that. Also, the number of women uh, or female uh, employees that have been promoted um, has increased from sixteen uh, percent um, in the three-year period uh, three years ago to forty percent in the last uh, three years. So, you know, changes like that make a significant difference in the positions that minorities can get uh, in an industry uh, or in an organization, and uh, are are very positive. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I'm so proud that we hit that OKR and, and, and you know, really kind of went beyond it. Right. So so the 40 percent um, goal was fabulous to to reach it and, and go beyond it. Um, Yana, I just want to get your comments as well. How do you think the industry has changed when it comes to equality for women since you started your career? Again, some positive examples of that. I know you've touched on many of it, but wanted to kind of close out with that a little bit. Um, I think it's an amazing change. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, when I was the only female in the room, you know, working for enterprise software company, and people asked me whether I brought tea or coffee, it's, it's not happening anymore, <laughs> you know. And uh, but what I think is great, and in a in a good way, 
in terms of the pandemic, what came out is that we can bring the whole person to work now. You know, we see kids and, uh, you know, anything on the Zooms and it's completely normal. I remember this, uh, that was some reporter on TV a few years ago, prior to the pandemic, whose wife and a kid came to the room and he was talking about some economic issues and it was a, such a big, um, you know, buzz on the internet, it went viral. And today it's, you know, we can be who we are. And I think this is great because it supports women because we are talking about what women need to be successful at work. And I think those structural changes as Helene uh, mentioned are, you know, starting from even not only changing the procedure in hiring, but changing the way how we hire. We ask different questions to make sure that the candidate pool is measured equally. And I think there are many organizations who are now being certified for equality in terms of equal pay, equal opportunities, and as well balancing, you know, the leadership and, you know, not only gender, but all the types of diversity, like age and culture and background within their organization. And I think it's great. So I, I applaud to that. I know that the moment we do not need to celebrate the women's history months is when we won because it's going to be all perfect. We don't need to lift up anyone because everyone is equal. So this is what we are driving forward to, I think. What a powerful thought. I completely agree. Completely agree. All right. So I want to kind of, uh, um, you know, go move to the end of, unfortunately, I mean, there's so much more to talk about, but uh, we, I wanted to kind of leave this, this session with, with some thoughts, right. As to what uh, all of, you know, what do you want the audience to take away before that? A quick comment. I love that Rose chart behind. Is that the She Loves Data uh, logo? Is that a Rose chart? Yes, it is. We got an inspiration from uh, Florence Nightingale. And, uh, you know, that's that's one of our actually leaders who said like, hey, let's do this. And then we adopted it. And it's very uh, loved, uh, you know, logo. Oh, wow. Well, it, is, yes. it is awesome. I love it. Love it. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Rose chart. Go and check it out, everybody. <laughs> See what that is. <laughs> um, so, yes. Yeah, so we put in some of the some of the I, I would say, you know, takeaways from this discussion that we wanted everyone to leave with. So I wanted to go through this. Um, uh, let's start with with uh, with you, Lizzie. What's your takeaway for, that you want people to kind of go with, you know, as they as they um, as we end this session? Yeah, sure. Well, we've talked a lot about confidence, and I think you know, lacking confidence comes mostly from comparing yourself to people around you. Um, so my biggest bit as advice would be, don't do that. <laughs> Um, be your own benchmark. I, I mentioned it earlier, but you know you're the only person who can measure how well you performed on any any given day. Um, so st stop looking around and comparing yourself to others, and just try and make yourself proud. Awesome, love it, love it. Yana, how about you? Um, I think that um, I would like to everyone think about their differences and turn them into advantages because we need to be different because that's actually what is needed out there. We can't be all uniformed. So, so change the way how you think about it, because if you add on being curious, if you add on, you know, kind of um, raise your hand when there is new opportunity, those new opportunities usually uh, lead to some exciting career changes in a professional life and, you know, a great new uh, advancement and growth. And uh, I as well want to say that, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about fail culture, but I think um, it's okay to fail, to learn from that and just move on and do something else, like be a little bit more experimental. I think especially we women, we beat ourselves up that we are, we have to be perfect and it's horrible to fail, but it's okay. It's just another lesson in life and we will fail many times and that's just fine. So learn from that, move on, and then enjoy, you know, what's next. How awesome is that? Absolutely. Fail fast, learn, and then keep moving. Agreed. Um, Helene, let's move to you. Yeah, so I think one, uh, maybe a little bit in, in line with my comments first was, uh, or earlier, was uh, to say yes if you get opportunities, especially if you're looking for opportunities to work more, more with data. If you think, you know, you, you might not be good enough for it yet, just give it a try, you know, say yes and just say intentional yes to the opportunities that you get and then the other thing is something that you know i didn't start until later in my career um i i, I don't know i think sometimes we 
we forget that we can ask people to help us in our careers and, and some decisions and maybe some support that we need. So finding a mentor and finding a community outside of your work is really, really powerful. And, and it, it gives you that, you know, other insight and a different perspective uh, and support that you um, that you uh, you need uh, to enjoy your roles and to also see what else is out there. So. Those would be the things that awesome. I would like to share. Awesome. Awesome. I added two of my own to your, your list there, uh, Helene. Uh, one is bending the bias. I loved this, this term. And this was actually coined by one of my colleagues here at TIPCO during one of our panel discussions last month. Um, it's not just about breaking the bias, no matter what it is, gender bias, diversity, whatever it is that we bring, um, uh, but it's about bending it. So if all of us can take small actions towards bending this bias slowly, then one day it will break. And like Yana said, we won't need the Women's History Month anymore because it's all you know, e you know, equity and equality. So I think bending that bias and how 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 do we do that by taking action? So I think all of us, we we have to take action. Whether you want to do the pivot after today's discussion, if you feel I want to I want to check out data, data analytics, take action um, or yeah. anything else in your life. So you know, once you take action, you bend the bias, then we get towards that goal. So I think. That's the thought that I want to leave this session with. I think this has been truly an inspiring discussion. Um, you did see the link there, www.tipco.com slash academic. If you want to go and check out our academic alliance for all of those um, students and academics out there, um, please check that out. We have uh, low cost or free products there. So check that out. And um, I cannot wait um, to hear more about data and how data is, is making a difference in everybody's careers, lives um, as we move into the future. Thank you so much to all of you for this fabulous discussion today. And um, I hope to talk to all of you again very soon in, in these sort of discussions. All the best to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.